Hello everyone, welcome to the British Lymphology Society Lymphedema Awareness Programme. I'm Margaret Sneddon, Chair of the BLS. So thank you for joining the second of our free webinar events. Lymphedema affects all ages and has many causes and contributive factors. And I'd like to thank all our members, supporters and partners for all the activities they're organising this week to share information amongst colleagues and the public um, about lymphedema. Anything you can do to share information, whether by email or social media, helps towards better outcomes for everyone. There are resources and tips on the BLS website, on the Lymphedema Awareness Week page, the Children's Lymphedema Specialist Interest Group page and the Everybody Can page that can help with this. This year, our webinars are focused on how it impacts on children, young people and their families. And I hope you enjoy the session today in which we hear from Ellen, um, who has lymphedema, and share some of her experiences of this in conversation with Dr. Christiana Gordon, who, in addition to being a patron of BLS, is also the lead clinician at St George's University Hospital Lymphedema Service in London, an internationally recognised centre of excellence for lymphatic diseases. Following the interview, Dr. Gordon will be available live to answer any questions. If you do have any comments or questions, please click on the question button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. If you have any other comments, technical problems um, or questions, please use the chat function. So I hope you enjoy it. We'll then go on with the interview and the video. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is our lymphedema video that we're doing um, to celebrate Lymphedema Awareness Week in March 2024. Um, as some of you may know, I'm Dr. Christiana Gordon, lymphedema consultant at St. George's Hospital in London, and I'm very lucky to be joined by Ellen today. And Ellen is one of our primary lymphedema patients, but has also become a friend and a colleague over the years. So Ellen, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, would it be possible for you to maybe introduce yourself and, and tell us how lymphedema has affected you and, and yeah, let us learn from you if that's all right. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, yeah, so I'm Ellen and I have primary lymphedema and this affects me in multiple ways. Um, I was born with it, but it wasn't really discovered till I was quite a bit older. Um, I have a wild syndrome type. So um, half of my body is affected by primary lymphedema. Um, some areas worse than others. So probably the worst areas are my arm and my leg and maybe my buttock as well. Um, and it was, I mean, I could talk for ages about this whole journey, but ultimately it was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, I was, I was discovered at a, my six week baby check, um, that one side of my body was bigger than the other side. And my mum, I was the first baby. So my mum and dad were, you know, completely new to everything. And the journey really went from there because it was so rare and weird and wonderful it took a long long time for them to finally work out that it was a uh, primary lymphedema and then yeah i've been under st george's now for a, a long time i suppose i can't remember when i first actually came to st george's but it was when i was quite young but i didn't live in london so i used to all i remember was going on the train and mum would always buy nice magazines and sweets and treats oh. and I'd get really really excited about going it was like mum would, would always be really nervous um but I would always be like really excited growing up and yeah so um and did now I'm 27. About, sorry did mum talk about did mum talk about how how difficult she found it to not get answers immediately has, has she opened up to you about that over the oh, years? oh yeah yeah definitely and I think 
I think my mum now still lives with a degree of anxiety that is directly attributed to that element of just not knowing and and every single day being a struggle and a battle with healthcare professionals when I was unwell in my local area and that just complete lack of understanding every cellulitis infection was a complete battle because I never showed up markers in the way that the doctors would standard want to expect and you know for her and and the wider family, like that definitely has had like a lasting impact. And yeah. I think that transition then to becoming an adult and taking more of my own responsibility on the health, like mum and dad have been amazing and and left me to it, but actually that's been really hard for them. And and now whenever I have any appointment, I always make sure I ring mum and you know, and and actually it, it lymphedema affects everyone in the family and surrounding um the patient so yeah it's, it's definitely been a bit of a journey and i i think i that, sorry do you think there was an element of relief once you came under a lymphedema clinic and and you you your, your mum was able to see that there were doctors and lymphedema therapists that knew what this was and how they could help you yeah yeah oh yeah definitely and for both of them, I think it was just like a huge weight off their shoulders because they suddenly felt like they had people on their side. And it's not necessarily about sides, but sometimes it can feel like that when, you know, when you're a parent of a child who's unwell, you're their advocate. And and actually, that's just so powerful and so important. Um, and having a specialist service who understands lymphedema was just amazing and i say to this day like i didn't truly understand what mum and dad went through until i've now had my own and i'm like i look at my little one and i'm like oh my goodness like how i said to my i literally said to my mum and dad i was like you can do no wrong now <laughs> i just don't know how you did it but you know it's it is what it is <laughs> is what it is <laughs> so you're 27 now um so you, I am. you've lived with lymphedema for as long as you can remember um yeah how how does it affect you um I think it's it's a really good question because the honest answer is it it does affect everything like it does it affects everything you do every single part of your day and I feel for me is a constant battle between letting it affect me and not letting it affect me. So you have to, for me personally, I find that I can be really uncomfortable and just feel really tight, heavy. The summer and me just don't go hand in hand. <laughs> um, and I think the constant battle between cellulitis not cellulitis recovering from cellulitis and and that constant worry in the back of your mind um that's something you just have to come to terms with um yeah i mean it does affect everything but it hasn't stopped me and sometimes probably it's important to to have some time to to rest and <laughs> and prioritize your lymphedema and prioritize not pushing it too far um yeah it's a, it's a constant it's a constant juggle i'd say yeah. but actually it hasn't held me back like i you know i i feel like i've had an amazing life so far and i'm so excited for the future so it's yeah, lovely really future ahead of you yes yeah <laughs> i do <laughs> so let can i try and take you back in time a little bit and and remember what your childhood was like with lymphedema and can can we learn anything we as lymphedema therapists clinicians or, or people that you know we might know someone with lymphedema how can we understand what challenges you faced maybe in childhood and, and your younger adult years how did it affect you at school what could we have done better to support you 
Yeah, I think um, I just I'm so passionate about this. I think it is the key to success. So I always like to, to remind people that if you were in front of someone, maybe someone you've only met a couple of times a year, and they're asking you questions about the stuff you're most upset about or most ashamed of, or you struggle with the most, or you have maybe been teased about, you're going to really find that hard. It doesn't come naturally. You are not going to sit there in front of them and talk about all those things really openly and easily. But unfortunately, sometimes healthcare professionals and other professionals expect that of patients, expect them to just be an open book straight away and and talk about all those those feelings and those those depths really of of their life and their every day and i think that the key to any successful relationship with um clinicians and patients is is communication it's getting to the root of what the person wants what they need and what they're struggling with and if you can really make the patient feel empowered to share those things with you and feel like they're listening to you, then you're only going to have a beneficial relationship going forward. But it's, it is really hard to do. And oh, I mean, I look back and it was so tough like i genuinely feel so lucky to be where i am now and i feel that i really do feel very positive about my lymphedema but that is absolutely not the case when i was younger i really really struggled and i would do anything i could to avoid talking about it showing it it being anything to do with my life i i remember like my parents would put signs on the door saying you need to take your tablets and 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 actually i just was not in a good headspace i i really couldn't accept it and it was only really when i started to engage properly with lymphedema treatment because my leg was really uncomfortable and cumbersome and because unfortunately from where i lived i wasn't able to access local lymphedema care because i was under 18 and i didn't have cancer related lymphedema um it wasn't until i was able to access that care that i truly felt like i started to come to terms with my lymphedema and i started to engage properly um i just think it's as simple as just asking patients how are you feeling about your lymphedema how how is your lymphedema affecting you and and always starting with that i think every single appointment there's unwritten agendas there'll be okay there's six months review we need to cover this this and this or you know their measurements are really high in their leg we need to think about that actually when you get to the nitty gritty of it which was oh it was so powerful i had a consultation with one of an amazing lymphedema therapist and he looked at all my numbers and in his head he was thinking right it's probably going to be focused on leg and then he one of the first things he asked me is what bothers you and i said well my arm that's what affects my daily living and my daily how i'm living my life and it was just so powerful because afterwards he shared to me that he was like, oh, it's, it's so powerful how I I directly saw how that influenced the consultation because I would have been thinking in my head, her leg is significantly worse than her arm. And I just think that's the beauty of it. And actually, it's not that hard to do. It isn't that hard to ask a patient, how are you actually feeling? And don't get me wrong patients will have unrealistic expectations and they they'll tell you things that you can do nothing about 
And as a clinician, that doesn't sit very well because you just want to help and you want to make everything okay. But all I can tell you, reassure, reassure you from a patient perspective, is ask the questions and give the patient that opportunity to talk. And even if you don't have the answers, you acknowledge that and you you just be honest with the fact that there aren't an answer right now but you take it on board and you understand where they're coming from because that's really powerful yeah yeah very powerful and, and you're right i think communication is is key um and it is it can be harder to do i think with children if you're not used to seeing children in your clinic but but it's definitely something that i think everyone can develop and and, and can do are there yeah. any- and have you got any memories about treatments that, that I don't know, any top tips or, or any any guidance for therapists if they're thinking about how to help um, children with lymphedema? Yeah, I think. And now there are some, there's some snazzier elements to lymphedema maybe like you can get some like snazzier looking garments and and actually maybe if there's scope I you know I know every area is different um unfortunately um but actually uh if there is scope to make it a bit more interesting and and a bit of color and choice as well so they've got ownership on on their treatment plan if you you know say what color yeah. you like and and they may yeah. think, oh, maybe yeah 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 definitely and I remember um when I was very young doing things like the wraps the velcro wraps are nice because you can learn to do those and 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 actually it's instilling that very early on that ability to self-manage and skincare again really important and it's just encouraging that with young kids that it's a it's a nice thing to do like you know let's do a bit of massage and and just keeping it fun and i guess as well there's that element of um it becoming a part of their life rather than it being a solution to a problem it's actually this is part of my daily living. Like I brush my teeth, I put some deodorant on or brush my hair. Like it just becomes that normal daily activity. And then you're not demonizing it and it's not becoming too medicalized. And it's just ultimately part of their situation and positive role modeling. I think the beauty of what we have now is we do have access to to people that are openly talking about lymphedema, which is just incredible. And if I'd been that age and been back and had that, it would have made such a difference. So just signposting as a therapist to various different ways to have that. I mean, there, there are some amazing people that that you and I know that are doing these TikTok videos. About yeah, yeah. That's been so powerful and it's-, it's Yeah. Really and, yeah. I've had random friends come up to me and say, oh, yeah, I've watched Lymphedema Outfit of the Day. And I'm just like, I love it. I love it so much. I just think it's so good. <laughs> Things are much better now than they have been, but there's always room for improvement. Um, yes. Just thinking about, you've talked a lot about communication from sort of therapist and, and patient perspective. But something that I feel really strongly about we could do better is communication amongst our our patients that have lymphedema in that community and we've we've tried to get things going with lympholetics um, and we've got a lympholetics this year which is very exciting I think that's in September in Bracknell Um, and you've been part of lympholetics before yeah yeah that's 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 a very and and don't know about it what what are your memories from being involved in lympholetics which is for those that don't know is is a a patient and family day where we try and get as many people together and, and make it a very positive day about lymphedema I remember the honest answer to that is my first memory is mum getting very lost. <laughs> yes, I think I remember that day. It was in the middle. Um, but uh, she, we had the best time. It was so powerful and it was so magical. And seeing other people with the condition, other families, and it was lovely. And I met a girl there who had a very similar pattern to me and she had it in the opposite foot. So it was just incredible to see that. And we shared loads of tips 
and loads of ideas around like shoes and where we'd get them and yeah i mean it's really powerful nerve-wracking to go i think that's important to say like i think it's normal to feel very nervous about doing that um but it was just amazing day as well though weren't you i think yeah yeah but you know i think it <laughs> yeah i i don't know i i mean it might just be me but i think it's just that feeling of wow like i'm gonna meet other people like me which you know is lovely great to see the the kids the teenagers chatting and not necessarily about lymphedema just about normal stuff and and then yeah. what I found lovely was the parents getting a chance to chat in this very relaxed environment with other families and and yeah feeling less alone and yeah I thought it was I thought yeah I think they're very special days but I, I oh, there's more that we can do should be doing but hopefully I can get my you know myself on social media a bit better that there will be ways to reach more children and families I think in the future that's the hope anyway um just thinking about complications of your lymphedema I'm trying yeah. not to be negative about lymphedema but but you know I, I know that your lymphedema has increased your risk of cellulitis infections and that's been something that you and I've tried to manage together for many years is there any any tips you can give people watching this as to you know how, how they can help their patients that think they may have cellulitis or how to manage it so i think the first thing to mention because it really really changed the game for me was the introduction of the like the the card the bls card that says you know, this patient is presenting, um, won't necessarily present with raised inflammatory markers. And that is so powerful. So I would, and that has helped me time and time and time again. And you know what, with my other hat off on, um, even within my um, working environment and meeting other medical students and other doctors, sharing that information with them, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. And it's just so powerful. So if people can get access to those, make sure you've got one or, you know, obviously it's on the, it's online as well. But um, that was definitely transformative for me. Um, knowing early warning signs is really important as well. Um, getting it under control. And I think that it's, about that open communication with your GP as well because that for a lot of people that's a barrier isn't it and and actually knowing that there are lots and lots of clinicians one of your one of them is yourself who are really passionate about making sure that GPs understand that lymphedema doesn't necessarily fit the mold and that the use of antibiotics is really appropriate and really important and there's you know again a wealth of information especially there's you know there's guidelines um on the bls around cellulitis and and actually that's so powerful and so important um as like a more sort of psychosocial is just it's really demoralizing when you get an infection it is it's really hard it's horrible it has a big impact on your life and the reality is you might swell up a lot more and you might feel like you've gone 10 steps back. Yeah. Um, as someone who's had a lot of cellulitis infections over the years, um, you do get back to it, you do. Like you can you can get back to how you are, you can, your, your swelling might be worse and there might be lasting impacts. That's just the reality, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, but, if you try and give yourself that time to feel sad and feel fed up and process those emotions you can then move forward and then and then keep going and get back on it and and actually there is light at the end of the tunnel but i don't want to be i don't want to sugarcoat it because i think it is really important that you do give yourself that time to feel fed up and i would say for me that is something that I worked on in the last couple of years. 
since COVID when I am a very busy person. I'm always doing stuff. I'm always keeping busy. And I realized so much of how much that was stopping me from feeling anxious, stopping me from being worried. But actually, I wasn't necessarily dealing with and processing emotions as much. I was maybe just keeping really, really busy and actually stripping that all back. As I'm sure a lot of us are experiencing, it, it, I realized how anxious I actually am. Like deep down, I am anxious about my health. I am worried about things. And now something nice to come of COVID is I feel now I want to share that message a bit more that it is really important to allow yourself that time to feel sad and to feel fed up. And then you can get back into keeping busy and doing things, <laughs> but actually make sure you are having that time and make sure you get help and seek help if you are struggling. And yeah. Very powerful message. Yeah, I think absolutely we should acknowledge the fact that you know it's not normal to feel happy 100 percent of the time and when something goes wrong process it and and allow yourself time to feel sorry for yourself and yeah this is not fair but yeah as long as hopefully there's enough social support and network around to help you get back on track then yeah, yeah. you can get back to where you were before before the infection but i think the other important message is to to maybe the healthcare professionals listening in is that prompt treatment and, and of cellulitis is really important and you know just recognizing that this is an issue for our lymphedema patients and supporting them as best we can will help yeah. good okay so i think probably i've picked your brains for long enough although i could chat to you for hours ellen if that's yeah. all right i'll <laughs> let you go because i know you've got exams to study for um are there any any you know messages you want to give to anyone watching um just thank you for listening to me i you know i still i still feel so lucky to be in the position that i'm in um to be able to talk about this and ultimately just try your best that's all you can do it's all any of us can do is try our best and be kind and just talk about feelings because <laughs> you know it's really important it is really important but the lasting message I'd like to say is just thank you. Like, thank you to every single person who takes the slightest interest in lymphedema because that is just so, so powerful and it's so important. And, and I still feel so grateful that people want to help us and it, the momentum will only just keep on growing as it should and lymphedema will get the recognition it deserves. <laughs> yeah, and I thank you on behalf of the BLS and, and everyone for, for you know, you giving up your time and, and being such a positive force um, for, you know, being a voice for those with lymphedema. So thank you, Ellen. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today and I look thank forward you. to seeing you again soon. Thank you, you too. Thank you so much. Um, well, thanks to Ellen and um, Dr. Gordon for that video and um, uh, Dr. Gordon for joining us live now. I'm also delighted to be joined by Teresa Hill, who should appear in a moment. Um, she's a lymphedema specialist practitioner and member of the BLS Children's Lymphedema Specialist Interest Group. Okay. So, welcome, Teresa. So, um, Teresa, the Children's Lymphedema Specialist Interest Group, organising lymphalytics, and it was lovely to hear Ellen um, speaking so positive about that experience. Before opening up to questions, is there anything you would you like to say anything more about lymphalytics and how to um, get more information if if people are interested? Yeah, 
I can certainly do that. The Lymph Athletics, um, the first ever one, and I've been very privileged to have been to every single Lymph Athletics. And uh, we learn just so much from the children and the parents, and it's helped the group grow so much. Um, it was in 2012, and most of them have been up near the Sheffield area. And this year it is on the 21st of September, um, and it's going to be in Bracknell. Um, so we're looking at to see how it goes there because it's been held more up north. Um, so we're very excited about that. We've We've got a fantastic group of people who are keen and motivated and what I found interesting at my very first one was when a child came up to me and said there's children like me here and it was like we'd done our job you know that they actually saw that they weren't the only one because these children are very um, isolated often and they don't know anyone else with lymphedema and I think that was one of the main breaking points for me that made it and it's not just the children, as Christiana was saying earlier, it's the parents, but it's also the siblings. Um, and the siblings are invited to the day. And it's really important that you treat them as a whole family. And what's so lovely is we're very fortunate, like Christiana, Peter Mortimer, Vaughan Keeley, do an education session. Um, so there are times, and then there are other helpers. So if they've got very young children, the parents can still go to these sessions. So it's worked really well that you're not just thinking about the children, you're thinking about the parents and all that networking and learning tips from each other. And that's what I find satisfying in my job is asking to the children what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And then I can pass it on. And sometimes we do like a buddy system in our clinic. So the children might have a child of the same age um, and they can talk to one another about what's going on. Um, but yeah, we're very excited about it. Um, it is on the LSN, it's on the BLS um, and all those clinics. Um, so there's 21 sites in the UK that see children. We're very fortunate in London because um, obviously St George's, it's the other side of the river, but it's not too far and we can refer directly. So we always um, get a diagnosis through St George's and they kindly see the children every three years. Um, but we maintain their treatment, do their treatment plans. And it's good because then we get to see them on a regular basis. Um, so we do encourage other people. To, and I must admit, I was frightened when I first started seeing children with lymphedema. And I went to St. George's a lot of times um, to get some input from the therapists and that. But I think it is about, and I've digressed a bit, about getting a clear diagnosis and feeling confident. And the Children's Lymphedema Interest Group, we work together and we can rub you know if there's a child that's slightly different we know we've got st george's we know we've got derby but we can sound off ideas about how to fit treat children you know as um, an individual and as ellen was saying and that is it's about them being listened to and it's what is important to that child um as well um, because there has been conflict i had once with a child and a mother and where the mother wanted certain but the child didn't want that and she actually said to her mother, it's me that's got the lymphedema, not you. This is how I want it. So it is, you know, sometimes I found that quite challenging at first. Um, the other area that I'm based in the community, which I feel very fortunate, because the other thing that we recommend is that they work very closely if possible. So we have a health for two about their lymphedema so that you can liaise with them because I'm often having to write letters because these children, especially if it's in their feet, have problems with footwear and they may need to wear trainers and some schools are very strict about it. So it's having that interaction as well, I find really um, works well. We also have to do safeguarding level three so that you know we're seeing these children. And we're fortunate we have a specialist children's nurse in the trust. So if the child's got other health issues, we can coordinate together. Um, the other thing I just want to pick up from Ellen's and Christiana's presentation, which was fantastic, was the other thing that we do automatically is we talk about the cellulitis and we give the cellulitis guidance to all our patients on their and when they, they need updating. And we also send it to their GPs as well. So they've got something in their hand. Um, so if they need to go to the GP and they see a locum GP that doesn't know anything about lymphedema, they've got the cellulitis guidelines. And I think that really helps a lot of our patients. Um, but yes, I know we, we want as many children to come along to the lymph athletics. I'm really proud that I've been part of the journey um, and it is um, 
it's just lovely. It's, and it's a whole, to see them grow is, is lovely. And, I, you know, I've got children on my caseload and seeing them grow from a toddler to a teenager and accepting their condition. And as Ellen said, the nice tie dye stockings, it makes the children want to wear them um, and giving them opportunity to talk about their conditions. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Theresa. You've raised a few things there. First of all, lympholytics is on the 21st of September this year, and there is yeah. a form if anybody's interest on the Children's Lymphoma Specialist Interest Group webpage on the BLS if you want to go to that. And you mentioned the cellulitis guidance, which is also available on our website and Lymphedema Support Network. Um, there is a question about the cards that Ellen mentioned. We do hold them and you can get them if you come to us at a conference, but the LSN hold larger supplies and if you want a bigger supply for your patients, then it's best probably to get them from, from there. Um, so there's a question for both of you on the, the list about what's the most challenging and rewarding moments you found for caring children and young adults with lymphedema. So I'm going to put that to you first, Christiana. <laughs> thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for listening to me yet again talk about lymphedema. And if I try and reflect about the challenges first, um, I think the hardest thing there's quite a few challenges looking after children and young people with lymphedema. The, the challenges might be in the clinic when you're you're dealing with anxious parents um, who are worried and you're the first person that they can sort of come and offload to because they, they, they're hoping that you have the answer. So you sort of the communication in, in those initial consultations can be challenging. Um, but I think communication is key. And so far, touch wood, all consultations have ended well and positive um, for everyone. They've been happy to finally get a diagnosis and, and reassurance that their child is going to be okay, or if it's if the child's old enough, they're reassured that this is something they can manage. Um, then thinking about other challenges would be when the families are forced to come to St George's um, for treatment, you know, and they may live three, four hours drive away, but their local service doesn't see children. That that I find really difficult because when they're children and they're growing, you need to see them every three to four months. And that's, that's you know, you're taking time out of school. The parents have to take days off work and, and seeing that impact on the family, I find challenging. Um, so I would put a plea out there to lymphedema therapists to perhaps not be scared about treating children. They're not that scary. They are so rewarding um, when you when you watch them grow and, and develop into you know, adults and yeah, it's it's so rewarding. So yeah, please don't be scared of treating children. Get in touch with us and and we will we will help you feel more confident in, in treating them. Um so yeah, I think that's probably the biggest challenge is is the lack of access of treatment for these younger people. Um the reward well, it's, had... prob it's probably worth saying there that there is a, a map with an indication of where in the UK there are services who do see children Although that even if they see them, generally all children are um, assessed thoroughly by either St George's Hospital or the Derby and Nottingham hospitals, but they can be cared for locally. Um, so there's a there is a list and a map on the BLS website, and we can also give more specific information in your local area, um, if need be. So sorry, Ms. Janet. No, 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 that's a great and valid point. Yes, I think it's important to say that we, we like to run a hub and spoke model. Um, so the St George's and the Derby teams, we do exactly the same thing and we communicate regularly. So so think of us as doing exactly the same thing. But we are both centres are very keen that we do get the chance to assess all children with primary lymphedema, just in case there's something that's been missed by the therapist. Just sometimes there are really rare conditions. That, that you need the help of a geneticist to help you unpick. And it's really important to, for that child and that family to make that specific diagnosis. But once the diagnosis and prognosis has been confirmed, we are absolutely delighted for that child to be cared for. And, and you know, if necessary, never come back and see us again, because, you know, if, if they're managing things well, that's fantastic. But we are always here to support local therapists if they just need to bounce ideas off us or want us to see the child again. Um, but even though there are a list of 20 something clinics across the UK, it's still not enough. You know, if that child happens to live just outside of that catchment area, they still have to travel several hours to Derby or, or to us for treatment. So, yeah, it's good, but there's there's room for improvement. 
Um, Shiza, you want to say uh, a bit? Yeah, I think um, the, the challenges I had first when I decided that, you know, that I would like to start treating children and I did go and spend quite a bit of time at St George's and with Jackie Todd in Leeds um, and I did it as part of my master's working towards it. And it is about building that confidence up as well, but it's also trying to get your trust on board because they're so used to you treating adults and not children um, that, it, you know, it's going through those difficulties as a practitioner. Um, and it is about just keep pushing and looking at what support systems are available in your trust. And, you know, I'm delighted that we can do it. And as um, Christiana said, we know that St George's is there. You know, sometimes I'll send a photograph and say, this is what I want to do. I'm not sure, you know, um, I had a child with a persistent Veruca that just couldn't get rid of and we were having issues. Um, and But we know there's other people that we can talk to. And I think that's what's so lovely. And I love about the lymphedema world. And that's why I've been in it for such a long time is because everyone can work together and no question is a silly question. Um, so the challenges were for me at first getting the service and it is about building your confidence up and seeing the children. Um, but I've learned so much from them. I think my biggest challenge is, is sometimes actually not the child, it's the parents. Um, because and that's what um, I do did find challenging when I first started, because parents have got, especially if they come as a teenager, it's not so bad. I find when you get a child from sort of a year old or a toddler. Uh, because they grow up with it but when you get a teenager that's been diagnosed the teenager and you need to listen to the teenager but sometimes you've got the parents saying this is what I want I've heard that this can all be done and it's let's take it one step at a time and it it's listening to that child as well and it's then when they go through that transition as well from being a child into an adult and learning to live with their condition long term and again I think as a lot, I've been fortunate lots of my children have gone to lymph athletics and I think it is about them speaking to each other, parents speaking to each other that really does um, help these challenges um, that we have. Yeah, uh, you've highlighted a couple of things about things that need to be considered if you're are going to be seeing children and I just like to promote the, the lymphedema mentors groups work on producing a children's charter which is available yeah. on the website. And I think it's important for anybody to read if they are thinking about seeing children. Yeah. Um, okay, the, the other half of that question was about the most rewarding. Um, I don't know if you want to, is there any one thing you say was really rewarding? And you know what, yeah, the most rewarding for me is to see my children wearing their compression stockings and having smiles on my face. I'm sure I, ha I have a young girl that I treated um, quite some time ago with primary lymphedema and she had uh, she was 16 when she got referred and she had um, swelling up to her thigh, her foot going up to her thigh. She was really distraught about it, absolutely devastated, came into the clinic wearing jogging bottoms to hide this up and we did an intensive treatment on her and on the final day when we got her in um, a compression stocking and then tights on top and she came into my clinic in a pair of shorts and boots and I felt you have actually accepted your condition now you know we went from baggy trousers to a pair of compression of compression stocking with compression tights on top and a pair of shorts and you know that to me I was just I still I loved it you know I, I was crying I was like she's accepted her condition and she says I'm not gonna let it beat me so that's my highlight <laughs> I'm sure Thanks, Christiana's Jesus. got lots <laughs> is there one you would like to share Christiana oh uh no no there's two there's, I can't single one child one young person out I mean you know there's stories of, of life-saving moments which are you know wow and fantastic but then I don't want to mention that case to belittle the the success that you get of a teenager who's accepting their condition I think everyone everyone's a success story in the end so I just find it so rewarding what we yeah. do um well I'll ask you a, a different question then as Ellen highlighted it took a, quite a long time for lymphedema to be diagnosed um, although the problem was evident as a baby and the long-standing impact that had on her mum and the family is that a common experience? It is. Um, although I'd like 
to say, I think I'm seeing a trend that we are getting referrals um, of babies now, li literally when they're a few weeks or months old, I think is something I didn't see five, 10 years ago. Um, and I think it's also really important to, to be mindful that it's not the GP's fault or the pediatrician's fault that there is a delay in diagnosis because lymphedema is not taught at medical school or it's only just making its way on the curriculum. So how can we expect a GP or a pediatrician or a health visitor to, to look at a child and go, this is lymphedema? We can't. We, Me, my fault. I need to improve education. We need to get it on all the curriculums. We need to do better training so that we can think, we can, we can teach these healthcare specialists to go, OK, there's a child with a swollen leg. OK, need to rule out the acute medical emergencies, but then need to think about lymphedema and then need to know where to send that child for further investigation. And we're working on it, but we, we need to do more. Um, but obviously the impact that that has on usually the parents more than the child, if I'm honest, is, is huge. You know, they've got worry what you know, my child doesn't look like the other children. Um, why is that? Is this dangerous? Is this going to be life limiting? What are the consequences? Yeah, and no one can give them answers really until they come to a lymphedema clinic. Um, so yeah, I, I do feel for the parents and, and the children if they have swelling that, that could have been improved years before they finally get to see us. So and yeah, there, there are challenges, but we'll get there. Thanks very much. The time has flown, we've actually come to the end. Is there any one quick message, anything either of you want to add to leave people with? I think communication to me, communication, communication, communication. Yes. Let's talk about lymphedema, you know, and get it talking. And if you've got children, you know, and let them talk about their lymphedema. So talk, talk, talk about it. So get, let everyone know. Okay. I think Ellen made that explicit in her video. Anything else, Christiana? No, just to, again, come back to communication and not just us talking about it, but us in the clinic thinking about how we communicate with the child and the parents and it is more complex because you've got you know, you, we don't know what the family dynamics are really like you just get a snapshot in clinic and it can be challenging especially with teenagers and their parents but if we just consider everyone's views and concerns and thoughts and wishes i i think we'll do a good job okay that's good thank you both very much for answering as many questions as we could cover today and thank you to everyone who's joined this webinar and remember, there are webinars on um, every day this week. You can still register. And even if you aren't free at the time, they can be watched later on if time is difficult. If you want any more information on lymphedema, the BLS, or caring for children and young people, um, go to the website. If you're interested in lymphletics, go to the Children's Lymphedema um, Specialist Interest Group webpage and you'll get everything there. There is a guidance, a, a guideline uh, coming out. It's not re quite ready, but the easiest way to make sure you hear about new resources like that is to sign up as a friend uh, with BLS. It doesn't cost anything, and then we'll let you know when it's available. But the Children's Charter, um, an algorithm of, to help um, work out what kind of lymphedema somebody has that's developed at St George's, the map, all sorts of information as well as cellulitis is available there. So thank you very much um, and hopefully we'll see you at some of the other um, webinars. Thanks and thanks to you both.